Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison from Happiness Is Egg Shaped. And today, the pod is going to reach the parts other rugby pods cannot possibly reach. We have a unique guest, one whose like hasn't been on before and is unlikely to return in future. This man knows more than he can possibly let on. Full of life, uh, social media and the run-up to Christmas has been absolute gold. I'm really looking forward to spending some time with this guy at some point in the future when restrictions and guidelines allow us to. He has done so, so much. He has been involved in so many different things, and I cannot wait to get into some or all of it in this podcast. I reckon this is one that we'd have to be about a six-parter to even scratch the surface. So let's get into it. Without any further ado, please welcome the boss man of the world famous Cabbage Patch Pub in Twickenham, just down the road from the stadium, the one and the only Mr. Stuart Green. Hello, sir. Bruce, how are you? Thank you so much for letting me on. It's very kind of you. I am very so, honoured. Uh, well, I'm very honoured because you're a very busy man and you've got lots of irons and lots of different fires. So giving up some time for me is hugely appreciated. So the Cabbage Patch Pub, t- tell me about it. Well, they say, and I think it's a decent argument, the most famous rugby pub in the world, and I love it. This is uh, just going into my 25th year now. Um, and actually, regardless of, of the Cabbage Patch, you know, just in the trade, not, there's not many landlords now that, that stay in the industry this long. Um, and I got in by mistake. I didn't mean to. I fell in love with it the first day I walked in. Um, my parents were furious. But I... <laughs> given up everything to take over a pub. They said I'd be an alcoholic by the time I was 21. Um, I'm not, thankfully. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, what it's opened up for me is is unbelievable, and it's so unique. Um, and the, and to ride on the back of the rugby game as well at the same time is, is just unbelievable. And, yeah, there is plenty of stories, that's for sure. So how, how did you come into it by accident? How do you get a job like that by accident? Well, I, I came into Twickenham to go to St Mary's University, which you know is a fantastic university just down the road. Um, lots of lots of players actually have started there, um, and we or well, I wandered up in my first week, determined not to end up skint, um, and uh, said to them, you know, I can I can work, and they said, look, we've got rugby at the weekend. Turn up. I'd had a little part time job at a bar before, so I I turned up on eagerly on the Saturday morning. Um, it was actually Oxford Cambridge, so it's a varsity match. When if you remember, varsity was far bigger than it is now. I know it's it's going to try and return into a much bigger platform, but it was sixty five thousand people at Twickenham. I was first man on site in a shirt and tie, and the governor at the time said to me, "Where are you? Where have you come from?" So I said, oh, "Just down the road in halls uh, with, at St Mary's." And he said, "Go home, get changed." He said, "You don't need a shirt and tie on a rubber day. You'll you'll be covered in beer within the hour." I went, oh, okay. So I ran home, got changed, and I loved it. It was awesome. Um, I'd already already followed the sport, not as as much, I guess, as I do now. You know, now it's part of my DNA. But, um, yeah, I, I worked the rugby day and went, this is amazing. What great fun. Um, and then I uh, I said, to, I worked, I then worked some shifts, um, completed my first year of uni. Um, I said to the guys who had the pub at the time, or the guy who had the pub, Frank, who is like a dad to me, really. I, I credit him with almost everything I've got, my teaching, my learning, what I consider to be a decent landlord, um, a bit more old school. And I said to him, we should open a nightclub upstairs. And he said, you're mad. That will never work. And I said, please, please, can we do that? And I I agreed to, I took the door money, he took the bar money, and I was 19 and I was making a fortune. <laughs> About six months in, he went, whoa, 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 let's stop this. He said, you work for me. <laughs> he said, I love some of this. So we um, we officially opened the Patch Nightclub, and that's kind of how I fell into it, really. And then a year later, I took over the pub, and the rest is history, as they say. The rest is history. You're still writing it. I love the passion that you speak with. Now, you're a, you're a people person. You That's where you thrive. And, you know, being in the role you are, you, you're one of these guys, you could have done anything, you could have made anything a success, and the Cabbage Patch is lucky that that's where you fell into. 
what what is it about the the pub environment that you think is so important to strive to maintain for me and and again this is where i tip my hat to frank and my learnings it, it's it's about being part of the community and it it really it actually upsets me if you for want of a better phrase that that more pubs aren't community minded that said there are hundreds thousands that are and do an amazing job make no mistake but it's it's those little touches i sort of use the the phrase comp, uh, community over competition and i strongly believe if you do the right thing in the community you know it'll come good in the end um and and people will support you and back you and there's been tough times. There's been times where, you know, not everyone loves a pub, believe it or not. Uh, and I find that hard to take sometimes, you know, take everything too personally. Um, and I have to remember that not everyone loves rugby and not everyone appreciates coming in on a match day and it's packed and there's plastic cups and it's shoulder to shoulder. And, and they don't think that's a great experience. For me, I love it. Um, and so do thousands of others. But it's doing that community bit first, which is really, really important you know, looking after your neighbours, supporting groups. And, you know, as we've chatted before, Bruce, the the big thing is is supporting those around us. And if if we can't do that, really, why, why are we here? Because when times are tough, we, as an industry, we moan that, you know, you've got to come out and support your local. Well, if your local isn't supporting the locals first, they're never going to come and support you, are they? So that's, that's what drives me every day. Mate, that is just so good. And I love that little catchphrase, community over competition. That's that's magnificent because then the competition isn't what's important, but they'll give you the the right to go and fight with others. I, I think it's awesome. What what sort of things do you mean by that then? What what is the pub doing in the community that means people have a sense of belonging to you? Well, we st I start at a very basic level. So the staff know that if they need to go out and get milk or they need to go out and get the newspapers for the bar or they need to get some, we try and try. And life isn't as easy as it as we'd like it to be, but we try and use the independence as much as we can. Um, and, you know, no disrespect to the big supermarkets, but the, we'll buy milk from the, from the corner shop, as it were, and the newspapers from there as opposed to the big supermarket that will remain nameless, but is it, you know, directly opposite the pub. Little touches like that, I think, is a great starting point. But then, actually, it's about the people in that, that we live around. So we back on to uh, sheltered housing, um, like an old age pensioner's home, if you like, but it puts a phrase better than that. And we, we support those. So every year we would hire a coach and take them down to the coast. Um, you know, it's important that they get that trip out. For some of them, that, that might be one of the very few things they do that year. And we do that in the summer and we take them to, to the pier and we walk along the pier. We give them all some pocket money to buy some rock and we stop for lunch on the way at an old, uh, the British Queen, an old pub there. Um, we bring them back to the pub for cream teas and, and then walk them home. At Christmas, we, we drop round presents to each and every resident um, and, and we bring them in for Christmas dinner, normally in January, actually, just because we're obviously so busy in December. Um, we take the opportunity of the lull of trade in January to support them. Um, but the, the, it's it's community groups as well. So there's over the years, I mean, I've had everything from pole dancing to... Um, I know very, that. You know, for fitness, Bruce, for fitness. <laughs> um, but there's been pole dancing lessons up in the nightclub. We have we still do ukulele classes on a Wednesday to help the aged, um, which is amazing, by the way. When they first started... I thought I was going to lose my mind because these lovely, lovely sort of 40, 40, 30, 30 40, um, uh, you know, a blue rinse brigade came in and they were great fun. Loved them, but they couldn't play a ukulele, let's be fair. Um, and it was pretty painful on a Wednesday morning listening to these tunes, if you could even call them a tune. But they're now two years in and they sound incredible. They're really good. And they're gutted because they had a little Christmas concert planned and that had to be postponed, of course, along with loads of other stuff. But, um, th yeah, they're now, they're now really good players and it's been great to see their progress. Um, so, that yeah, that's just look, a few of the many, many things we do. And I, I can imagine you welcoming every single one of them in because you're, you're so engaged in, in what's going on. 
those those little bits are building the, the little connections that build community. The, the thing is, you, you just don't know who they're going to tell. You know? And so they leave here. If they leave here with a good experience, they're going to tell someone, aren't they? You know, and, that, and that's pretty obvious in, in any business book you want to pick up if you're learning about starting a business. And if they go home and tell someone had a great time at the patch, maybe they'll, they'll remember that and come back in. And, and that's the sort of the whole overriding message, really. I, I started, goodness me, years ago now, the community toilet scheme. And this isn't a very glamorous story, but it, it, it's a great example of why I think we should think outside the box sometimes. So as an internationally visited town, you know, and we have people from all over the world come to see rugby in Twickenham. And yet, again, I, I think it would be, I'm going to guess 20 years ago, maybe, the council shut the last of the public toilets that we had. And one of our frustrations was that, of course, the pubs, not just the patch, but the pubs would often get targeted in terms of any urination on a match day and stuff. Oh, it's the pub's fault, it's the pub's fault. And I said, we need to do something about this. So after endless meetings with the council, we sort of came up with this scheme that we went, look, there is loads of us with, with toilets. We're more than happy to let people come in and use them. Do you remember back in, well, it still happens now, that fear of purchase. And I wanted to get rid of that. You know, you nip in and buy half a Coke and you can see the man sort of jogging at the bar. Can I have half a Coke, please? Because he thinks that's the cheapest thing he can buy. <laughs> Buys it and there's can I use the toilet? And actually, you knew all he wanted to do was use the loo. For, for me, let's let him use the toilet. And then maybe he'll go, they're really nice in there. I'll come back. Or maybe I'll stay and have a drink or a meal or bring the family. So I said to the council, if we, if we develop this community toilet scheme, you fund us to give us some money to help pay for extra toilet cleaning costs, et cetera. But it was far cheaper than maintaining a public toilet, which, let's be honest, they're always grotty, aren't they? So we then created a map. We had a number of businesses sign up that took that, that payment, but also then um, were quite happy to let people in. And we set some rules around it. You can refuse entry to anyone at any point. Obviously, some restaurants were closed in the evening. They weren't open in the morning. So we made sure we had a, an array of businesses around. And... It was, it was so well received. People knew they could come in without fear of purchase and, and use it. And, it, and the penny dropped the year or, or the, the time a young lady walked in heavily pregnant and said, can I please use the toilet? And, a, and a, another local business had refused her. I just said, of course, why, why on earth would you not do the right thing? And I knew, we'd, I knew we'd made the right decision. And then lo and behold, I took it up to, it was Ken Livingston was mayor then in London. And he, he asked to see the scheme and we introduced it to him. And some London boroughs took it on. I was interviewed by uh, Branson, believe it or not. I was interviewed by some other uh, BBC radio, Nottingham, I think it was. And they now introduced that all over the country in certain towns and, and stuff. And I, you know, as I say, not a very glamorous subject and not nothing to do with rugby, but it's about... Actually, we're here. We're a town. Let's do the right thing for the people that are visiting us. Yeah, and I'm, by the way, I'm not surprised you've spoken to anybody. You you could tell me any name, and I would say, yeah, he's spoken to them. But that's a uh, the rugby clubs who could be listening to this going, we should do that because it would encourage people to come in, and then they might bring their kids to the mini, and they might. I, I think it. I think it's gold. Now you you are full of enthusiasm. You obviously love the job. Which has kept you there for a long time and kept it drives, people... drives my missus mad. <laughs> of course it does. Well, there's there is a beginning to get there. I like it. <laughs> how how many hours a week do you work? You strike me as the guy first in and last out. Pretty much. I mean, yeah, I I kind of take the I've I've an amazing team around me. Don't get me wrong. And over the years, had had some amazing workers who, without them, I'd never have got to where I've got to now. You know, they they hold the pub and they work some crazy hours. Um, I kind of take the view that you, you've got to justify your existence. And if that means being first in, I was at six o'clock this morning in the pub with, with a, a contractor in to fix something. And, you know, that was the thing to do. And, and we'll be last out today, probably, I think. And it's, look, the last two years, is, other than when we've been closed, because of everything we're living through, it's, that's been tough. You know, there's been some massive hours uh, and weeks done. This, these last... Well, the whole of December, the whole of November and December, yeah, I've barely been at home. But um, but thankfully, I love it. And I think that's where, where you know, my amazing partner and four kids who sometimes don't see me for days and days on end, but they know, they know I genuinely love what I do. So, 
yeah, some crazy hours. Can you still pull a paint? Uh, I think so, yeah. No, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> two, two at a time and one with your nose and... Oh, minimum, 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 <laughs> minimum. The, the bit about London being an international place, and, you, I mean, you do, you have visitors from everywhere, and England play, you know, various teams, and people are desperate for that day out to Twickenham. But organising a bus trip and sending Christmas presents around and having Christmas dinner, those are things that pubs, centre of the community, used to do. You know, the, the big boys, Bino, they would, the boys would go to the races, and then you'd take the family down the coast and all those things there's not many places still doing that and you and you don't have to do that so what is it what is it keeps that ethos going look it's a, it sounds very easy to say here but it, it really is as simple as do the right thing if you do the right thing frank frank who's the my old governor who taught me and he's used to have this phrase and i still say this i've trained lots and lots of people who have gone on to hold their own sites now. And, you know, I'm really chuffed with that. There's a number of people that were my, you know, top top board here and they now, um, they now got their own pubs. And it was out of acorns grows trees. You've got to plant them. And sometimes they don't grow. But if you nurture them, sometimes they do. And you, you won't always get that immediate return. And let's be honest, we're still running a business and we've still got to financially make it work. But if you can, thank goodness, plant some acorns that you don't necessarily need that monetary or community um, come back immediately eventually it will come back and help you and all of the adults with learning difficulties which is another subject maybe we'll get onto it's a massive passion of mine you know the people we've helped over the years they still come in now and have their parties and their families come in and see me and I genuinely get choked when when they come in there's there's kids I've taken on work experience who now will come in and and either they they are in full time employment or they're at university or their parents come in and go oh, I just thought I'd let you know how they're getting on you know that's 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 wicked I love that I love that yeah and you're you've got the skills that an international rugby coach has got you're managing people and like you say you're helping them with their development and you're proud when you send them on who who's coming to the pub uh, and I I reckon you've met probably everybody. Who's come into the pub and you thought, I, I can't believe this guy's having a pint or this person's having a pint in, in my pub? Wow, good question. Good question. Yes, you're right. Probably most have been in at some point. I mean, uh, there's lo there is so many. I mean, the, there's the big names, Delalio, Carling, um, you know, those boys are, are in. Jason Leonard still pops in. Um, Brian Moore, I still spend time with. Uh, you know, they're icons of the game. There's then some of the Kiwi boys are in. I remember the year we held uh, Twickenham had the World Club Sevens. It didn't last very long, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And the, the Kiwis boys came in afterwards and they said, Look, is there any way that the coach said to me, I forget who he was. He said, can we do some beers for the boys? I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. I said, no problem at all. Let's shout them all, all some drinks. I said, we've got to, we've got to do the hacker, right? Well, within, within minutes, it's like, it's like talk about an opportunity. They were stripped off. I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't even blinked. And there's, you know, 20 topless Maori staring at me. And the bar sort of cleared. This, this sea of people moved and they just smashed out the hacker or a version of. Um, that was amazing. I went, oh, my God, I can't believe it. I couldn't get the phone out quick enough to film it. <laughs> um, that was funny. Um, you know, and then over the years, we've we've done loads of stuff in terms of podcasts and things, you know, like like, like your huge success that you've got now. But uh, Jim Jim Hamilton and Andy Good have done the, the rugby pod here a few times. I've done more stuff with Lawrence and Ben Kay, you know, and, I'm, and I am – I think myself extremely lucky to be able to have that opportunity over the Lions that Scott Quinnell was in with the Sky Bus and BT Sport are in with with who was in for that Ben Kay and 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 the like and you know Danny Kerr still pops in and Oogs pops in and rings me if he needs a table and that's cool I, I, I love that, that that a lot of the players now um, have my number and will will drop me a text and say listen I'll be in on Saturday sort me out a table can you and and I'm more, you know more than grateful to to do that. Um, 
And then we move up to, to bigger stuff, of course. I've looked after the England team a few times now, um, post-matches. Um, the uh, I remember one year after the Six Nations, actually, that they rang me a few days before and they said, look, the boys need somewhere to go and we've, we've, we're going to finish late. I think we played Scotland last match of the Six Nations and we it was a late kickoff. And they said, look, can the lads come back? And we cleared the pub split in two and there's a room next door, our music bar. And uh, we arranged to have them in there because the windows are blacked out and it's a, it's a, you know, a bit secretive in there. And uh, I met their head of security a few days before and we talked through how we were going to get the boys in and no one would know and it would be great and this is what they need and wives and girlfriends could come and blah, blah, blah. And um, they, he said, I'll ring you, ring you from the stadium. So the match finished. They obviously did their after-dinner uh, post-match dinner um, speeches and blah, blah, blah. And he ran me and said, right, we're on the coach. We'll be with you in five minutes. And we'd done all of this really tough stuff to make sure they could get in without being seen. And in <laughs> down pulled this coach with England written on the side. <laughs> it blocked the whole of the road because he couldn't do the three-point turn he wanted to do. <laughs> and, of course, hundreds of people went, well, that's the England team. <laughs> in the end, he, he jammed this coach couldn't move it past the traffic lights. And they went, well, let's, we, we, we've balled this up now. And out came the England team and we got them in. And, of course, and everyone knew they were in there. Um, you know, and it was hilarious. But uh, that was that's then we move on to stories that some of them I can't tell. You know, an, an honest landlord couldn't tell you what went on in that room, bro. <laughs> yeah, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't force you because I know how important it is to you. So those, those people that come in, there must be punters that come in and they cannot believe their luck with with what they found with some of the the people that just breeze in and press the flesh with you at the door, and they probably just want to be treated like everybody else, do they? they some of these big names. Yeah, and I think without getting into that sort of football rugby debacle and debate about the differences, that, that that's what's still lovely that honest humbleness that that rugby still has, and yes, there's been some incredibly famous names like. Um, you know, um, Lyon has been in here, Fitzpatrick, Sean Fitzpatrick was in down in Guinness and and people just leave them alone. Yes, they go over and ask for an autograph or a photo, but they're not bombarded. They still lack respect, you know, and there's there's players that I've looked after that will say to me, look, can I have a table in the corner out the way or can we be in a room and shut the doors or whatever? And we'd, we'd honour that. On the, I've got to tell you, though, most of the time, they're just happy to grab a table and be in. And most fans will look from afar or grab a photo, but there's that boundary that they tend not to cross. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I know it's differently, but, you know, Christian Ronaldo or, you know, Rooney walks in and it's just can't, we just wouldn't do it. I don't think. And I mean, no disrespect to them or, or, or football, but um, that's what's lovely about it. You know, when Danny was in recently and a guy, a guy said to him, you don't know where the toilets are, were you? And he, I know you mentioned this on his podcast, but, he said, go over there, turn right at my boots, because his boots are on the wall. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how he navigates himself around the patch now. Wherever his memorabilia is, Daddy will direct you. <laughs> that, that is genius. I love that. What was the, And I don't know how much you're able to divulge here, but I'm going to ask you anyway. What's the strangest yeah. request you've had? What, from, from a rugby player? Or from or from anyone? What's the strangest request? The, how a room's made up or a drink or a, what's the strangest request you've had? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Well, I mean, we've had the usual rugby club shenanigans, drinking out of, well, almost anything you can get, anything that can hold liquid, I think <laughs> I've seen it be drunk out of. Um, uh, it, I mean, costumes is, is the other one. Nakedness, we always start the, a rugby international with the team and, and we'll have 50 to 60 team members in working. Um, and working their socks off, but we sort of start their briefing by saying, look, if anyone's offended by flesh, you know, really don't look, because these are rugby fans who have a tendency to strip off at any point. Um, so, yeah, I've kind of seen seen all of that. Um, I've, I remember the, the 99 World Cup, actually, um, and we had three big bins outside that were, that were for glass, you know, for recycling glass. And they were before you could do mix. There was a, you know, do you remember the old big brown, green, and white bins? Yeah. You had to put the right bottle in, and, and a, there was a, a, 
um, lovely, well, uh, unbeknown to me, the phone goes, we've shut, we've closed, we've cleaned up. And uh, the nightclub had opened upstairs that was a, in a, is a, has a separate entrance, so you wouldn't really know it was there necessarily. The rest of the pub's in darkness. And the phone goes, and it kept going, and eventually, I, normally I ignore it at one o'clock in the morning because it's someone desperate to get in the club who probably shouldn't get in. And I picked up the phone and I said, can you help me? Can you help me? I said, sorry? You've got to help me. You've got to help me. I'm in a bin. <laughs> Long story short, this lovely Kiwi lady had decided at gone midnight to sit on one of the glass bins. And she was, she was probably, you know, if she played rugby, she probably was in the front row. And she collapsed the bin lid and was stuck. And apparently, well, this was... We got her out about 2.30 in the morning. She'd been in there a good couple of hours. She'd fallen asleep and then woken up. She must have had glass. Well, she did have glass all over her. And had worked out where she was and rang the pub. And we, we went round with the doorman and we managed to pick the bin and get her out, the poor thing, and get her in a taxi. So how long she'd have stayed there for had she not remembered where she was? I've got only know. Um, was, my next question was about to be, are you still shocked? But I'm beginning to think, no chance. Honestly, nothing shocks me. <laughs> nothing shocks me anymore. <laughs> nothing at all. Um, I mean, we used to have a Wendy house out the back years ago, like a wooden playhouse for kids, you know. Uh, this is going back 20 plus years. And I remember coming in one morning and it was in the corner of the garden. And so, and it was winter, so the garden really wasn't in use. Midweek, there wasn't many kids in using it, so you didn't really see it. And anyway, I eventually found this guy. I'd been living in it for four days. <laughs> And it's only when I found him in the toilet. We opened at 11 o'clock and I found him in the toilet shaving. And I said, you're right. He went, oh, I hope you don't mind. I said, all right. But I don't remember you walking in. And I said, what? Where have you come from? And he said, well, you know, out the back. I said, what do you mean out the back? Like he'd booked in, you know, like he was expecting an invoice before he left. <laughs> he said, I've been living in there. I'm so sorry. Anyway, long story short, the guy had had a row with his wife. and he Because I thought he was homeless. And he wasn't at all. He just... Said I only live around the corner, and this was my best bet. <laughs> Just bizarre, honestly bizarre. But there we are. Oh, so, that is gold. I had no I mean, idea. There's, there's, there's the rugby players that have got up to mischief. That again, I'll you know, I'll, I'll never tell you who because that's why they come here. I'd like to think that they know I'd always hold their secrets dear to me. And maybe I've always said I should write a book one day when yeah, I've absolutely. when I've retired and I've got nothing to lose. But um, yeah, there's some all sorts of stories where, I mean, a, a certain rugby team, the only way to get rid of them, I literally bribed them with beer. And when I was loading cases of beer onto this coach, saying, please go home. It's like four in the morning, man. You're going to get me closed down. Please get out. And they would yeah. say, I'm so drunk they couldn't really understand. And obviously, we're responsible in terms of what we let people consume, of course. But yeah, there's been some parties that have gone well into the night. Your your autobiography would be worth millions. It would just be the, there'd be people paying you not to write that. I reckon. Maybe that's the key. Yeah, maybe that's what that's my retirement fund. <laughs> <laughs> so, the the thing I feel about the cabbage patch, and and I want to go more often. Um, it doesn't matter what the results been down the road. The cabbage patch will still be a positive enjoyable place to be absolutely and that, and look that's the game we all love isn't it and that's the joy of it the fact that regardless win lose or draw people are able to come in and enjoy themselves and you know the the all fans are welcome um and and you know there's some shenanigans that get up to but actually honestly in 25 years 24 years i've probably seen five punch-ups that lasted all of 10 seconds and are sorted out amongst themselves. Look, I'm not condoning violence. Of course, none of us would. But, but it, it, you know, it, it's happened. But it's just lovely atmosphere. And I've seen over the years far more women and children and families come in now. You know, those first rugby days when I was 19 or, or so, there were, you know, it was predominantly men. Um, and it's been great to see how that the game's developed and, the, and you know, the industry's changed and you know, our lives have changed. And now we, it's, a, you know, it's even more welcoming, I guess, to everybody. And that's, and that's great to see. 
Uh, absolutely. And it's, it's not an England pub. That's the other bit I find brilliant about it. You're just down the road from HQ, but it's not an England pub. It's just the cabbage patch and everybody's welcome. Yeah, that's true. And and even then, if you take it domestically, you know, when Quinns are at home, of course, we're a Quinns pub in that sense. But, you know, I travel with the away fans to see Quinns as well as a, as a season ticket holder. And, you know, it's, you don't even consider which pub you well you consider which pub you go in but you don't have to have to check that that's the appropriate pub to be in do you it's it's perfect and in fact we seek out where where the um the best rugby pubs are whether whether we're going up to bath or, or bristol or wherever and we all mix and that's what's great and that we, you know some of the fans are just all fans are amazing but some of them are crazy my my fondest memories i of of away fans probably Claremont, whenever Claremont are in town, I've still got some great friends now who are Claremont fans all over social media. But you know, when they're in, I know they're here, and my god, the noise they make! <laughs> you know, they turn the pub yellow. You, in fact, you'd walk in, you wouldn't know it's a Quinns pub if we're if they're playing Quinns. Unbelievable. Yeah, um, we, we Claremont played at Murrayfield in one of the European finals, and I was there with my wife and my best mate and his wife, and we ended up next to the guy with the drum. <laughs> <laughs> It was just mad. And we've got pictures of the four of us just going with the guy, the drum just. But you're right, that that yellow is stunning, isn't it? it and it just brings a whole another level to the atmosphere for the club. They really are. I mean, sometimes I wish we were a bit more like that over here. I've got to be honest. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's brilliant when we're all in full voice. But they're, yeah, they're a credit to them. And Munster's the other one. When the Munster boys and yeah. girls are over, my word. I mean, what they played, Quinns, I think it was the quarter final of the European Cup, the old Heineken Cup, wasn't it? I think. And they literally turned the, well, they turned the stoop red. There was a bit of an uproar about how they obtained tickets and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, my God, they did a good job. They, they were everywhere. And actually, I got, I got a few complaints, you know, saying you you sold out to the Munster fans. And we hadn't. We just opened the doors. It's just, this is where they chose to meet. Um and yeah, you, you wouldn't have known Quinns were playing that day. There was red everywhere. It's and, and that's that's it's almost a credit, I think, if somebody's saying you've sold it, what you've done is you've made them feel welcome, and they've felt like they can come through the door. I, I think that's a huge credit to you. The, uh, the the hacker is always a great thing to witness. Have there been other moments when, when the Munster fans have started to sing where the hairs in the back of your neck have stood up and you thought, I'm really privileged to be here? Yeah, there, there, there must be a few. But, I mean, uh, I mean, even recently, if we go back to the 2019 World Cup, that, um, that final where, you know, especially as the timings were that we were open so early, I think we opened at seven in the morning, by the time we opened the doors, um, there was well over 600 people queuing to get in. It went around the, around the corner. I'd never seen anything like that. And, uh, you know, that a part of me, there's part of me is just goes, yeah, I've, I've done all right here. Not, and it, I'm, I'm not driven by the, by the turnover. I'm not. I mean, look, I run a business and I need it to work. But that's not what drives me. It drives me to go, look, these people want to be here. And that's cool. I love that. And then when we were packed, and it was heaving. Um, all right, the result was <laughs> didn't go our way, but the, the the place was heaving. And when we sang the national anthem, and everybody was singing, and all going twenty four years back, nobody had their phone out, you know, because mm. we didn't record anything. And everybody's got the phone, and they're recording it, and they were sending in videos and po you know tagging us in. And you kind of go, this is this is amazing. And as yes, we sung that national anthem, that was cool. Um, the two thousand and three win, of course, was amazing. Um, and actually, again, I know it's recent, but the Quinns win um, back in the summer. You know, as a Quinns man, of course, that that makes me even prouder. Um, but it was amazing because we'd gone through such a um, rough time of not even knowing whether it'd be open. We had tickets to the match and then were given back. No fault of anyone's other than the fact that the stadium was put back into this sort of 10,000 people only. And we made the decision that actually as the group that I sit with, if we couldn't all be together, we would stay in the pub rather than a few of us try and obtain tickets. And I think a lot of people did that, although don't get me wrong, I'd love to have been there, Bruce. But actually the atmosphere in the pub was amazing. And 
And that game, as, as many people have said, irrespective of the teams, as a game of rugby, was incredible. I mean, who thought we could turn up and, and do a better job than we did in the semi-final against Bristol? So that was that was pretty special as well. And those memories, I mean, you're you're at your work, but those memories are not just professional, are they? They're they're hugely personal to you. Yeah, and I th- and chucking some sort of the cliches and whatever, but that's why I'm still here because for me it is personal. I, you know, not everyone will like me. I I, I have to accept that, but I am the Cabbage Patch, and. Someone one day will take over and do an amazing job for sure, but I, I, you know, my blood, sweat, and tears, if you like, are in here, and so I want it to work. And because I'm not driven by by the money, if if you like, it, it's driven by the love of the industry and the love of the game that we're able to be so closely connected to. Um, that's why we still do it, and yeah, that's 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 the driver. Good luck to Davy Boys taking over for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Fer- being handed the keys to Old Trafford when Fergie leaves. Yeah, you're now the manager of the cool. Cabbage Patch. Follow I that. About that. I'd like to be as successful as Fergie, but yes, I get your point. <laughs> oh no, it's it's amazing. I've always said I, 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 many people said over the years, and I've been offered very luckily. Touch we've been offered some lovely positions in other places and other jobs, and and I just. I couldn't go. I couldn't go and run another pub now. That's 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 not me, or certainly certainly not a sort of like for like. Oh, there isn't a like for like. But you know, just go and run a pub. That's I, I'd do something else. I I um, would struggle, I think, as well to come back in if someone else. If I retired tomorrow and someone had it, I I don't know if I could. I, maybe I'd find it easy. I, I'm not sure. I just right now it doesn't bear thinking about. I, I couldn't imagine someone else and then coming in and seeing them do it slightly differently. And it look, it could be better because I'm far from perfect, but um, I, uh, uh, I would struggle, I think. Yeah. It, it's good to hear you're going to be there for a while, but I, I've got this vision a bit like Ferguson being in the director's box. You just sitting at the end of the bar like this, <laughs> just, <laughs> just watching everything going, uh, wouldn't have happened to Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> Just added all that pressure to the new person. Go for it. Yeah, good luck with that. Good luck with that. <laughs> now, one, one of the things I didn't know until you and I spoke a bit like this um, on a screen, and, you know, I am desperate keen to come in and have a beer with you in on your own patch, is the amount of charity work that you do that goes beyond what you've already spoken about and, and reaching parts of the world that, you don't really have any concern with well that's true i mean there's 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 a lot of work we do as a business or as a as a name as a pub that that people probably don't realize we do and there's there's the rugby stuff as well uh, that we go on and going back to sort of the community stuff that i'm really passionate about is i just think if we can't help those that we live around i mean and every charity is of a massive worthy cause, don't get me wrong. But I start at home first. So the people that we that we're that we live around need our help the most because they're the people we can connect with it pr- perhaps easier than others. Um, and so I set up a work experience program well al- almost 25 years ago. I hadn't been here very long. And it was it was born out of we 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 offered work experience placements for for mainstream kids young adults that was totally worthy of course but the young adults with intellectual disabilities um were being overlooked um and i had a call from a lady i was starting to do some support with in in uh it was richmond college um and their special needs department and she she ran me in a panic and just said look this this young man has just been thrown out of his work experience um in a neighboring village and he um, he'd gone into a restaurant, and they didn't realise or hadn't considered that he had intellectual disabilities. And I literally said, "Well, you you can't work here. That's not something they're able to cope with." And they threw him out, and he was literally sort of almost on the street, for like, "Saying I don't know what to do." And the teacher said, "Look, can you can you take him?" And I said, "Of course we can." And from that, we then set up a program. And I realised that actually these these young adults 
don't get many opportunities. And obviously, given some of their disabilities and um, and and that that they, they there's always going to be um, a short amount of uh, work that they're able to to put themselves onto. And so, I set up a work experience program that they can come for us for a week or two weeks. Um, it's mainly centered around the kitchen, to be honest, depending on what they want to do. But if it's front of house, um, we, we teach them some front of house techniques in terms of serving. Um, obviously, age is considered if, we, if we're dealing with alcohol, but delivering food and, and waitering. But a lot of it's for the kitchen based. And we, what we found was, and we've honed it over the years, that actually let's leave them with a skill. So it might be that, that they're, they, the idea is that they leave us and they can make a meal. So whether they live with a parent, a guardian, in a hostel, whatever that may be. They can go back and cook a meal for either themselves or their family. And it might be as simple as a jacket potato with, with beans. It might be a, a spaghetti bolognese, um, a pizza, what, a burger, whatever that may be. But we, we work with them and pick a dish. They'll spend all week helping in the kitchen with prep. And we give them a really honest overview of what a work life is like, but e equally tailored to whatever their skill set may be. And some of them are very, very basic. Um, and then, the, then they're allowed to make their dish. They'll hone their dish all week, and then they make their dishes a special on the Friday. We we manipulate it sometimes so their sales are, are good, but we have a little competition. How many did you sell that day? And we always invite their parents or their guardian in to have that meal. And then the idea is, and they're left with with instructions on that, that they can perhaps go home and cook that. And if that's one thing they've got, they can do. For me, that's that's you know that's a big goal. The, ultimately, we'd love to put them into employment. That's the plan, of course. But some of them are going to really uh, will struggle to find employment. That's you know, that's, there's no point pretending. But actually, can we leave them with a skill? Um, and the the other thing that that I think as an industry we don't do enough is we don't look beyond the box that we're looking in already to employ people. There is a huge, vast amount of people, and I I echo this to all industries that we we make employing people really difficult. There's people with intellectual disabilities that are, that are absolutely brilliant at some of the roles I need. I'll give you some examples. We have, a, we have a guy who comes in once a week on a Thursday, and he does all my Sunday veg prep. He peels potatoes. He peels carrots. He peels the parsnips. He chops them. He does what he needs to do. His, his intellectual disability means he has to do very repetitive work. It has to be quite simple, but it must be repetitive, and we, we can't deviate from that. And if we do, there's a process to deviate from it to introduce a new job. But for him, he finds that massively rewarding. He gets paid the same as anyone else, holiday pay, et cetera, et cetera. He is one of my team. But why as an industry are we not looking at these people to perhaps do these jobs? Probably because we're too scared, probably because we, we're fearful of health and safety and everything else. And I get that. But I do think we need to do something to look outside the box we're looking in now. We know we have a staff shortage in this industry. Why are we not looking at more people to come and work with us that could do a wonderful job on some of the roles that we need. Housekeeping's one in hotels. You know, I, I employed a lad who all he wanted to do was clean the tea towels and the tablecloths and the laundry and fold them. And he had to smell them every time because that was, you know, part of what he did. But he loved it. And he was absolutely brilliant. He wasn't late. He didn't go out for cigarette breaks. He didn't constantly check his phone. <laughs> you know, he didn't try and sneak up. He was amazing. Um, and there's loads like that. And, and over the years, I've I've employed... Oh, we're, we're well over 100 now of people with intellectual disabilities and I just wish I could do more and look, if, even if this is it if there's a platform where one employer goes, do you know what actually, maybe I should look on the other side of the fence and maybe there's people that could do a brilliant job for me um, then, then that's worked. It, it's not I know you're saying you're giving them a practical skill but you're giving them a sense of belonging, you're showing them respect, you're making them feel valued which then hopefully when they go into other situations, there's greater confidence, there's greater communication skills and okay, it might not be employment, but just making people have that sense of worth is, and you've kind of mentioned this in a few areas, it's worth more than pennies in your pocket, isn't it? Oh, without doubt. And look, these, these guys, I have another guy who works for me on a Tuesday and he does front of house and the bell will go for food being ready and out it'll run. And we've taught him about cleaning the table down properly and all, all the things that he would need. And he loves it. And his, his parents come to see me. And I remember a sort of few months in and just said, look, is everything all right? How's he doing? And she said, you don't understand. He walks taller. He, he, he's a more confident person. And, you know, it, 
I, I, I just love it. And I, I just wish we could do more. I would have my whole team would be like that if I could. Sadly, life is never that simple. But, but um, if I could do more to help those people, I really would. That's, I, I genuinely love it. And I, it genuinely upsets me that we don't look more into that field to try and develop employment. We, I have landlords moaning they can't find someone. And yet you think there is, there is people out there. I know not all pegs will fit all the holes. I get that. Um, and you have to have a, you know, I, I can't credit my team enough who I pull them along on this journey. <laughs> they, they have to be part of it, but they genuinely love it. On a, on a Monday night, our whole side of the pub is given up to adults with learning difficulties. It's called the Monday Night Pub Group. And it's somewhere that they can go. Nothing is different other than the fact it's slightly controlled. There's an element of of, of control there from from uh, a key worker who, who makes sure that, that, you know, that, everybody's safe but they walk into a pub they order they, they they buy a beer they play games they watch music videos um they chat relationships have been formed relationships have definitely broken <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it's brilliant but the staff fight to get that shift on a monday night they genuinely love it and and again i i had two members of the team who who were part-time um they they left to go into social care because of what they oh. did and I think that's cool. You know, that's not cool. That's amazing, Stuart. That is amazing is what that is. Well, I, 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 thank you. You're very kind. But I, I, I don't think it's particularly difficult work. I just think sometimes we're so focused on... But it's maybe not difficult work, but it's difficult to, to put it into practice. The work's not difficult, yeah. but having the belief in the ethos, creating the environment and making it happen. As I said earlier, you're doing everything that a coach of a World Cup winning team is doing. You're doing it in your environment. And I've I've now, just in when you were speaking there, I've now cracked it. I know what you're going to leave the Cabbage Patch pub to do. What? You're going to be the mayor of London. <laughs> It's got to happen. It's got to happen. Are you? Can, can you imagine the people that would vote for you? Can you imagine your campaign trail? <laughs> it's well, maybe. maybe. It, it's <laughs> got. It's that. got to happen. Maybe I'll try Mayor of Twickenham first. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a given. Come on, that's a given. Stuart, I, I absolutely love it. I'm. I'm conscious of the the time. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I do, and I, I do no, I'm sorry. Absolutely not. I could, as I said in the intro, this could be a six-parter because there's so much to you, to the pub, and you know I think organisations become they get shaped in the image of their leader, and the Cabbage Patch is a welcoming place where people are respected, they have a sense of belonging, where communication is strong, and it's just bloody enjoyable to spend time there. And and I think that sums sums you up. As you look ahead, I know you don't want to look too far in the future, but what does the future hold for, for Stuart and the Cabbage Patch? Well, look, I think we keep keep doing what we're doing. I, I still I still love it. I've always said if I wake up one day and I don't love it anymore, I'll stop. And if I wake up and don't think I can learn, I make I've never stopped learning. And I say that all the time. And I've I'm far from perfect, but I do think every Every rubby day, I find something new that I could perhaps tweak to make the business better for either us as a business or more enjoyable for the consumer. Um, and I still learn. I definitely don't know everything. Um, and so, therefore, I want to carry on. And because of its uniqueness, um, because of the opportunities it's given me, I, I, th th why on earth would I stop? You know, and I know we're running out of time, but, you know, I've been able to take the patch on tour to Ibiza and do the IB for 10s with some wonderful people, Abby Edwards and Claire Purdy comes with us and some amazing people. That's great. I know we haven't touched on Kenya and Mombasa and we brought 15 kids over from Mombasa to show, give them a rugby experience and teach them, or not teach them anything if you like, but um, to go back and help fund a school there so they can get them off the slums. Things like that, that that's perhaps not all pubs are able to do. And there are some incredible pubs out there, make no mistake, that do amazing things. But yeah, being able to have those opportunities still drives me, and it's it's really exciting to you know to to keep going and see what the sort of the next adventure is. Really, I, my ultimate dream is to open a cabbage patch somewhere else. I I'll be honest, I don't think it'll ever happen, but just because life's different, and I do have kids that need to see me. But you know, it'd be cool to open a cabbage patch 
in other rugby nations and then go and visit them. Be the area, the manager for all of those would be cool. Just fly around the world following the rugby. Right, we're, we're, we're going to clip that. <clears throat> we're going to put it out and just watch your phone go nuts as people all over the world start going, yeah, come here, yeah, come here. And there'll be... <laughs> Uh, I reckon you should go to Hong Kong. Definitely go yep. to Hong Kong. You uh, should have a Kiwi cabbage patch, an Australian cabbage yeah. patch, South African Sid- one. Sydney, I don't Wellington. know if you, you guys would welcome us up there, would you? Can we? Have oh, hundred percent. I could just imagine you get one of the three wheelers, a bit like Del Boy with Twickenham, Paris, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. It. <laughs> you, you, your big duffel coat on. I reckon that would be magic. I love it. Oh, so now, I, I, many moons ago. When I first met Sean from Fill Your Boots, he's obviously a very good mutual friend of ours and yeah. a fellow Quinns fan with you. And he sent me a message saying, do you want to play touch rugby at Twickenham? And I was like, 100% I do. And he said, where are you based? I was like, Edinburgh. I went, all oh, right, sorry. I was like, no, no, I'll be there. And I came down and I stayed in a hotel across the street from you. And I came in and I was just on my own. And the bar staff were there, and I had a look around. I don't think I saw Danny Care's boots, but I saw various bits. And I just thought, I, I could get used to this. This is this is the place for me. And you were you were all so welcoming. It's a brilliant place. I can't wait to get back there. Thank who you. who would you love to walk into your bar and serve them a pint? Doesn't have to be rugby. Who would you love to to come in and order a drink? Wow, what, a, what another great question, Bruce. Um, I mean, right now, right now, and I know this is going out a bit later, I wouldn't mind Boris walking in and having a word. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know something? As soon as that question left my lips, I thought he's going to say Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> but no, let's ignore that one. But yeah, I, I've got a few things I could do with saying, saying to him, I'll be honest. But ignoring Boris for a minute, because he may well not get through the door. He might be barred. Um, let me think. Wow, that's a great question. Anybody? Uh, I'm not. I'm honestly. I'm not sure. I mean, uh, all of rugby royalty's been in. I mean, Eddie Jones has has popped in. I'm, I I never got to uh, chat at length to Martin Johnson. I'd like to have. I'd like to have seen him. That would be cool. Um, I've, I, although Jason and has been in, and I've I've met him a few times. I've never had a proper session with Jace. Now, maybe I shouldn't because he may, he, he would absolutely drink me under the table. Um, and I know very fond of the guys up at the Sun Inn and that's a great pub that Jason's local um, in, in Richmond there. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind having a sesh with Jace after our sesh with him. That would be cool. Um, there's some stories there. But th- look, most of them have been... Well, there's been some good people that, that I'm still great mates with now that, that have come in and... and work for me and now play professional rugby. In fact, some retired. Remember Matt Garvey, who, yeah, who yeah. was uh, captain of Bath in, in his in his latter years. I mean, Matt worked for me. He went to St Mary's. He worked for me on the bus. And he, he um, we remember telling him that we'd never make a rugby player. <laughs> he proved us wrong there. My God, well and truly. Um, but yeah, I'd, 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 I'd have to go away and think of that, I think. But, do, you, do you know what makes me chuckle? Uh, a mate of mine, Robbie McRobbie, who's the CEO of Hong Kong Rugby Union, and he's he's a bit like you. He likes to think outside the box. And he got David Hasselhoff to come to the Hong Kong Sevens, and they did a whole Baywatch thing in front of the South Stand. I reckon you should get the Hoff <laughs> into the cabbage patch. I think his wife's Welsh. I think they, I think he's been to the Millennium she Stadium. Is, isn't she? Yeah. yeah, I reckon you, you need to get the Hoff in there. Right, I, I'm, un, I'm interested in this one. What what's your tipple? What do you have to drink? Uh, Guinness for me on a match day. Start on the Guinness. <laughs> Love a pint of London Pride, of course. Um, of course. <laughs> how could I not? Um, and then uh, once I'm done with that, I mean, a, a, I'm a I'm not a wine buff, but I do love a, a decent glass of wine. There isn't anything I wouldn't. I love. I mean, I love a single malt and a whiskey. I love a port. I mean, I'm just reeling off drinks here. I go back to my parents' thing. I'll have to say, I wouldn't be an alcoholic. I'm not. But, uh, but yeah, a, a decent pint with the boys is is everything I love. And then to finish with with perhaps some port, I, I do love a port or a brandy. That's for sure. Oh, I, 
I just, I'm desperate, Stuart. I'm now just open the gates. I'm, I'm on my way. It's been so good to chat to you. We've, we've run over. I started to wrap up and then I got carried away again. But Stuart, at the end of these pods, I always ask people to finish the sentence for me. And I, I'm interested to know where you're going to go with this. So for you, Stuart, happiness is? The cabbage patch. Absolutely. Mike, Mike drop and we're done. Oh, <laughs> Stuart, thank you. I've I've loved this. And as I say, I, I know you've won awards and you've done all I mean, there's so much more to talk about, but as a as a starter for ten, I think you scored seventeen and a half. So thank you so much. Bless you. Yeah, I listen, you you need to come down and we need to finish those stories over a pint. <laughs> yeah, the the ones that we can't also. put out on this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I need I've to know names, God of damn it. Photos. <laughs> yeah, go, scroll through your camera roll. That's what I need. <laughs> yeah, Stuart, thank you so much. All the best. Stay safe. Thanks very much. Have a Merry Christmas. See you soon. Cheers, Bruce. Man. Take care, thank mate. you. Bye. <laughs> got, got to love that. Um, probably a little bit different from what you were expecting, but absolutely exceeded all my expectations, and my expectations were very high. I love the guy. He speaks with passion talks about building relationships, making memories, and and that's the whole point we're here, isn't it? Get yourself to the Cabbage Patch in Twickenham just for the sake of it. Whether there's rugby on or not, just get yourself there and have a chat with Stuart. I cannot wait for that time when I can be there. If you've enjoyed it, you can catch us on Apple, Acast, and Spotify. You can watch on Facebook and YouTube. I'm just fulfilled. My my cup overfloweth with London pride, served by the one and the only Stuart Green from the Cabbage Patch. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, catch the back catalogue. There's lots more names to come. Stay with us. And in the meantime, stay safe. My name is Bruce Aitchison from the Happinesses podcast, and my happiness is egg-shaped.